Well, hello everyone. My name is John Paul Gaston. I am currently a master's student at the University of Washington. My project have two advisors, Travis Thonstad and Paul Calvi. The title of this project is The Shear Behavior of Macrosynthetic Fiber Reinforced Concrete. So I think the first question really here is, why do we want to use fiber reinforced concrete? Well, first of all, it has several advantages. It improves durability, increases ductility, has better crack control, and potentially reduces the congestion of reinforcement. That's kind of what we're looking at in this project. With that, there are a few challenges. The shear contributions are not recognized by the code, especially for um, our plastic fibers, our, our macrosynthetic fibers, and there's also limited test data. So that kind of comes down to what are the project objectives here? Our project objective is to develop a rational design equation for the contribution of macrosynthetic fibers as supplementary distributed reinforcement for shear. Now, I just made several different claims about the benefits of fiber reinforced concrete, but it's not just for me. We actually looked at some other projects that, that already studied this. Uh, so in this bar graph, there are a few different kinds of projects. In the gray, we have some steel fiber reinforced concrete without stirrups. You can see that dominates most of them, especially earlier when there was no macrosynthetics. Um, the blues are, are those with the actual, like, the plastic fibers, the, and there are very few that actually have stirrups. Well, actually, no, the dark blues are the ones with the plastic fibers. The blues are the ones with, with stirrups. And typically, these tests are done uh, with beam specimens, so they're subject to both flexor and shear. So let's take a look at uh, one of these specific uh, research topics. So this is a beam that, that was tested, or this is a set of beams that were tested with both stirrups and fibers. So basically they had like a square matrix. Uh, the baseline is a plain concrete beam with no stirrups. They also added some stirrups to some, some fibers to others, and then to complete that square, both stirrups and fibers. So this bar graph right here kind of shows what each one of those additions kind of contributes to the shear strength of these beams. So you can see that the, the bottom blue, most of the concrete dominates most of it. Then you have the stirrup contributions there in the red. The fiber contributions are in the yellow. And at the top, they have this, this part they're calling synergy. So the beams that had both fibers and stirrups had a little bit of extra strength compared to those that just had the fibers or just had the stirrups. So an extra contribution of some kind of what they call synergy between both the stirrups and the fibers. So we're going to look at just the shear resistance of the beams. So the shear resistance of the beams are determined by a few different factors. At the top, we have the compression zone of the concrete. We have the shear, or the, the aggregate. The stirrups also contribute here. And then the dowels at the bottom can contribute in dowel action. Beyond that, especially in fiber beams, we have some fibers bridging this this crack as well, which provide a little bit of shear resistance. Uh, beams are one way of actually studying that this year, but we wanted to look at something a little bit more specific or a little bit better, a better way of actually analyzing it. And that, and that way is extracting just the shear panel portion of it to study just that, that the shear section. But in order to do that, you need a very specific piece of equipment. And thankfully at UW or the University of Washington, we have one of these. So this is a picture of our panel tester, actually in the process of, of testing. So this is our, our complete setup here. Uh, there's several different parts, starting with just the tester itself. We start from the top right. It's basically surrounded by a large steel steel frame that keeps everything rigid. Inside of that, there are there's 25 blocks which are connected to each. No, 20 blocks each are connected to uh, two links. 37 of those links are controlled by uh, hydraulic cylinders, and three are, are rigid links that I just hold into place at the bottom. So you can see the hydraulic pistons, 37. There are three rigid links down below here. In order to power this, we have a pump here that, that takes all the pressure into this load maintainer. The load maintainer here splits the forces into the rest of the hydraulic system based on what kind of uh, load state we want. In this case, in this project, we're doing direct shear. So there's only, we're only using two of the ports. Another part of the setup is our, 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 our conventional uh, system in the back, which, which we'll, we'll look at later. 
In the front, we have our non-contact instrument system, and then we also have a time-lapse camera. So that, that kind of completes the, the initial setup here. Uh, for this project, we had three different tasks. The first task was to assemble a database, which you saw earlier with that bar graph of different fiber, uh, fiber projects. The second task, which is ongoing and right now we will look at, is actually taking these specimens and testing them. We'll then analyze the data. And the last part here is we're going to basically evaluate other empirical equations and then develop a rational shear model for it. So if you look at the specific test matrix we have here, it's very similar to that beam test, where we are varying both our transverse steel and the amount of fibers in it. Uh, the fiber volumes here, uh, four of them are at zero, the 0.26% and the 0.52%. The 0.26 is a pretty industry standard uh, from, from the manufacturer, and the 0.52 is specifically set because that's the maximum that they would recommend. The row X here is our longitudinal steel, which goes in the other direction. We keep that, that ratio very high in order to ensure that these panels fail and, and have a shear failure. And then the other transverse steel are in these ratios. Of course, looking at numbers is kind of a little bit difficult, so might as well show some pictures. So this, these are each one of our uh, reinforcement ratios. The longitudinal bars, which run east to west on this, on this paper, are continuous, meaning that they go through both sides of the blocks. Uh, we have some other small steel elements around that are discontinuous, and that is to create, make sure the boundary zone is well uh, reinforced, and so the failure is ensured within our, our test region. And then the transverse bars, which, which are running north-south on any of the uh, reinforcement ratios that are above 0%, are tied on each end and actually don't go through the blocks. Uh, the process for actually manufacturing these panels is, is quite interesting. So the first step here on the top left, so this, this actually runs top left and kind of reads like a book. So on the top left, we have the blocks which are attached to this casting table. Casting table is like a big steel plate with, with holes in it. And each of these blocks are then bolted down. Then the, uh, the rebar is put in there. Each of these rebar sections also are also threaded at the end so that bolts can be put in there in order to hold them to place. Once they're all put in, we, we additionally have tie wire, on, or put tie wire on it to ensure that they stay very rigid. And then finally, there are some gaps in there. We put some plasticine into it to make sure that this whole form is concrete proof. I mean, basically waterproof, or it doesn't, the concrete doesn't seep out. Uh, the picture on the top right is us mixing up one of our concrete batches. That concrete is made right on house, and then we hand place it onto, this onto the form. Underneath the table, we have a, a vibrator that externally vibrates it after every stage of actually hand scooping the, the concrete onto it. And after, after we complete the cast and of course strike it off and make sure it's nice, we then wet cure the, the specimens for seven days. So the wet cure consists of putting a burlap with water on, or burlap over it and make sure the burlap is wet. And then we also put plastic to ensure that it stays, stays that way. And following the, the seven day cure, or the seven day wet cure, we then cure it for additional 21 days in the lab before testing on the 28. After we make the panel and then install it into the machine, we then add some instrumentation. So this is the, the non-contact instrumentation. They're, the, they're basically LED targets that are set up into a grid on the front of the panel. And this, uh, the reason it's offset from the edge is that's, that's, that is the test area, which is inside that, uh, is the area that it, we're, we're, we're meaning to test. The output from this is a 3D depiction of all these points. And basically, when we do our data analysis, we need to make sure to rotate the system into, or into a coordinate system that we want, which is also shown on the picture with labeling of, of our targets. Besides the non-contact instrumentation, okay, so besides that, we also have uh, some conventional instrumentation. So this consists of putting in this, the same test area. We have brackets on both sides and a rod that runs through it. One side is, uh, is strictly attached to the bracket. The other is free to move. On the one that's free to move, we add a linear potentiometer that basically measures the change in the length there, so we can get the, st the strain off of each of the directions. Beyond that, we also compared the conventional instrumentation to the, the non-contact instrumentation to ensure that both of them are actually being accurate in what they're showing. It's always good to have a double check, and also if you can, on, on these kinds of things. Uh, the test, 
And so after all that, we actually begin our tests. And so the process for testing these panels consists of loading it up to the point of, of crack, first cracking, and then we drop the load by about 10% in order to ensure that there's no extra creep. We then crack map it. Beyond that, we do additional load stages where we, we increase the load by 500 PSI, dropping by another 10% to, to crack map that and do that until failure. So you can kind of see that on, on this, on the picture on the, the left here, where that, that is one of the crack maps we produced for, for one of our panels. The arrows there are kind of showing uh, exactly the, the shear stresses that are, that are imparted on this panel. And we can kind of, we, we know that it's uh, imparting shear stress by the way that the cracks are, are, are forming on it. Beyond that, we, we take these crack maps and actually digitize them so that later when we're working on our, our shear models, we, it's easier for us to, uh, to pull off the, the parameters that we need. So beyond that, uh, I was actually able to do the data analysis on the first two panels, which were plain concrete. And then I, I took those results and compared them to a similar project that we also did at the University of Washington with the same panel tester and similar uh, specimens. And thankfully, it looks like the, uh, the trend is the same. The, the panels are performing with, within the same behavior. And then alongside each one of the panels, we also cast some specimen or companion specimens. These are to test other, other properties, the, the compressive strength, the, elastic, the modulus of elasticity, and most importantly for uh, fiber concrete is the uh, ASTM 1609 test here. So that is our test setup on the left. We're using an Instron uh, 600 to uh, press down on this beam while we're also measuring the mid-span deflection. Uh, so these are some of the plots that, that came off uh, one of our, our fiber tests. And again, thankfully, the, the results are also consistent with what we expect with the lower percent fibers uh, having a less residual strength than the higher percent fiber mix. Uh, that kind of comes to the progress of where we're currently at on our project. Uh, we have five panels that have been tested and two more have been constructed. Uh, the data analysis have only been completed for the, the first two here. Uh, this, this test matrix is all the, the same uh, than the same as the one that I showed earlier with the specimen names showing the first one being the amount of fibers and the, the second set of numbers being the reinforcement ratio. And oh, it's always nice to have a, a, a beautiful picture here. So th these are uh, the stack of panels that I currently have in our lab. Two on the top are, are the ones that are constructed. The rest of them have been tested. Well, later, we'll be using these, uh, these panels to do pull-out tests to kind of understand if the, the fibers also have some contribution to the bond of steel bars as well. So I showed you kind of what we're done. What's next? So obviously, I still have to finish up the rest of the construction and testing of the panels and then do the data analysis for them. After that, we'll, we'll take that process data and we will apply it to the rational shear model, behavior model, and also uh, compare that data to existing empirical formulas. With the real goal of this project being uh, to develop recommendations for the shear design of elements that have both macrosynthetic fibers and uh, steel reinforcement. So with that, I'd like to go through a few acknowledgements. Uh, first off to the ACI 123 committee for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, secondly, to the ACI foundation for providing funding for this project. Uh, there are several in-kind material contributions from GCP Applied Technologies, Cal Portland, and Lafarge. And lastly, uh, I'd like to thank all the people on the advisory panel for this project. Uh, they're from committee, uh, ACI Committee 544. Uh, they've been invaluable with their recommendations and, and knowledge on this subject. And so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their, their time and attention.